Hey everyone, welcome to a very special episode of the Cutting Room Movie Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Tom Detloff, and I am joined today by two co-hosts, Max Cook and the counselor, Adam Shoulder. We're going to be talking about To Catch a Killer, uh, a film that was made a couple decades ago about John Wayne Gacy. In a couple of minutes, we're going to have the two stars of the film, two-time Tony Award-winning actor and Golden Globe winner, Brian Dennehy is going to be with us, and Gemini Award-winning actor, Michael Riley. Max, Adam, doesn't get better than this when you're talking about To Catch a Kill. I'm kind of shitting my pants right now, Tom. This movie was so, like, I don't understand where the hell it is. I don't know why it's on YouTube, busted into two parts. I want to find out from these guys what this movie meant to them. I want to get into the psyche of Gacy. I, I want to get dark. I do, too. Now, listen. Now, here's the amazing thing. I have been correspond. You know, I correspond with fans of the show. And so sometimes they ask me, so what are you guys doing? What are you guys coming up with? Let me tell you something. I mentioned To Catch a Killer. And these, the, they started to come out. They, they started to come out of the woodwork. I mean, there is, there's a whole league of maniacs that are in love with this movie, Max, including yourself. Oh, I love this movie so much, and I'm turning people onto it. Everyone's getting into Denny. He, everyone's getting into Riley. Everyone's getting into Riley's little mustache. I mean, right. it's it's awesome. <laughs> Max, is it true that you went out to dinner with your wife the other night dressed as Pogo the Clown? It is true. She loves that. I have to do whatever I can to get her going, Tom, and Pogo just just gets the lady parts humming. Well, I do know somebody that has dressed up as Pogo the Clown, unfortunately, and that is uh, the great Brian Dennehy. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the program today. No, it's great. It's fine. Nice to be here. Nice to, I, a lot of uh, references I haven't heard in a long time, and it's always nice to hook up with Mike Riley. He's a wonderful actor. Absolutely. Michael Riley, yeah, he's also with us. Michael, thanks for coming on the show as well. Thanks for having me. Uh, hey, listen, this is, uh, this is an intense film, and I'm sure for the both of you, acting-wise, uh, it had to be uh, an extraordinary experience for many reasons. I want to start with Brian. Brian, you play John Wayne Gacy in this film a complete and total maniac. I mean, this is something that, uh, I mean, it, it had to weigh on you mentally, man, you know, doing a role like this. Uh, you know, I just want to simply start off by asking you, I mean, uh, how, I mean, how did you, I mean, listen, what was your angle? How did you get into the psyche of one of the most horrific human beings of all time, man? I mean, what, I mean, what did you go through? You know, the funny thing about that, uh, I had a conversation uh, sometime after that picture was made with uh, Anthony Hopkins, who, of course, had a great success playing uh, Lecter or whatever his guys, you know, and won the Academy Award, and we talked about it. <laughs> and uh, uh, Lecter said, how did, how did you feel about that? And I said, well, and I said, what did you do? He said, well, I just picked this very precise Kind of, you know, Alec Guinness one time years ago said that the key to being a successful movie actor is to never blink, never blink in close-ups, never blink under any circumstances. Always keep your eyes staring at something. He said that's pretty much what I did. <laughs> and uh, he said, "What did you do?" And I said, "You know, the funny thing is." I realized pretty quickly, reading the books and reading and talking to various people, this is a guy who lived a normal life. Right. I mean, he had this little house in, Vin in Vincennes, Illinois, in which he lived with his wife and I think two kids, or at least one kid, and his mother-in-law, this tiny little frame house, attached to which was this garage, which had become this uh, studio of horrors. And they all lived there together while this was all going on. And he had a little business where he built uh, cabinets and so forth and, and small stores and, and uh, drug stores and so forth. He was a, part, a member of the Democratic Party. This right. tended to be a, a political slam. Yeah, he was a major player in the Chicago well, not a major player, but like, he was a player in the Chicago area. Polish, he was very active in the Polish... Democratic community, but there was a famous photograph of him with uh, Jimmy Carter's wife uh, at some function or another. But he was incredibly normal. 
I mean, he was a normal, he's a working class guy. He had a little business. He has a little truck, a little panel truck, which came in handy when he picked people up off the street. And he, uh, so that's the way I played him. I played him as a guy who is, which which is what really makes him scared. He's, yeah. Yeah. Now, Michael, you you play. You'd never even notice him, and then when he gets into his little room with the with the victim, he becomes something else. Right. Uh, but uh, that that in itself seemed to scare the bejesus uh, out of everybody. But I, I have to say this right at the top: one of the most important people in this project was Eric Till who did a brilliant, brilliant job. I mean, all of the things that people talk about in terms of that movie. Yeah, that was all Eric, eh? It was Eric. Eric, yeah. uh, Eric was a genius at that. I mean, to make a career, for example, the dropping the camera slowly down into the... Uh, into the, uh, the crawl space. Crawl space, and then having that pump go on suddenly. I mean, I, I can imagine it, it caused quite a few heart Heart attacks across the country. Those little touches. Yeah, it's amazing how well the film plays uh, even today. I I had an opportunity to watch it a week ago, and it was. I mean, I I just I couldn't I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. I mean, for a tell like it's a television movie, and for being a television movie, it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Michael, you played a detective that's uh, tracking this uh, this complete. Lunatic, you're tracking Gacy. I asked Brian about, you know, how he prepares for a, a, a role like Gacy. Now, you know, most cops, in order to catch the killer, have to get into the mind of the killer. Uh, I'm sure for you, you're not only getting into the mind of being a cop, but as an actor, did you also try to get into the mind of John Wayne Gacy through through your character? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, it, and through the characters specifically, I mean, my journey was just to go back a bit. I mean, I, I remember when I first went in to read for the part, I, I, I told them point blank that I was too young for it uh, early on because, you know, Joe Kozenzak, wa, you know, was, of an, I mean, I was 28, 29 years old at the time that I played it. And, you know, the character, Joe had a, uh, you know, a 15-year-old son, which was around the same age as the young boys that were, that were being abducted uh, and found in the crawl space and so on. So there was, uh, you know, I, I, so then it basically went, I basically, you know, did the actor no, no. I just talked myself out of a role, basically, and then it went away. And then, uh, and then I think somebody else was going to do it for a while. And then at the last, at the 11th hour, and I don't know all the backstage machinations of how this worked, but suddenly it was like, okay, we're starting in four days. Do you want to play him? And I, it was, I think it was more like six days. And I said, well, you know, I couldn't say no. It was Brian. It was Eric. It was, you know, an amazing part, great writing. And I'd worked with Eric Till before. And I was very keen to work with Brian. And and so I basically said, okay, I'll do it if I get to meet the guy. I said, can I meet Joe Kozenzak? And they said, uh, yeah, sure. And so they flew him down to Toronto. And for four days, those four days out of those seven, when we were getting ready, I had the privilege uh, uh, to sit with uh, with Joe just at a restaurant with a dictaphone in the middle of the table, and that's how I prepared. I mean, that's right. and it was a, it was an un, unbelievable kind of way because you could actually sit there and I mean I've done this a number of times in my career where I I meet people I've played and to sit there with. You know, reading the script is one thing, but to be able to look to Joe and go, okay, you know, flip, flip, flip. Page on page twelve here. When you walked into his house, what was that like? Uh, and then you're getting it straight from the horse's mouth. Oh, it, was just, uh, it was just a great shortcut. And, and, and quite oppositely, Brian, you did not uh, obtain access to John Wayne Gacy, right? Well, he there was, was a on lot Death of material, Row. of course. Uh, a lot of material that uh, had been some very good. Uh, there was one called Dark Impulse or something like that. A really intense book that had uh, studied him psychologically. Um, but, you know, it was uh, the, 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 the story alone was uh, pretty motivating. Yeah. And he was, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of newsreel of him uh, to, to look at. He was, like I say, a very ordinary guy. Did you try to contact him? It wasn't ordinary. It was right. Did you try to contact him like, you know, 
through letters. He so, wrote me. He wrote me a letter. He uh, did. After, after the movie came out, I still got it someplace. My lawyer. Got it. I'm sure you do. Wrote me a lawyer. Uh, he wrote me a letter. Uh, 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 Gacy wrote me a letter saying, uh, "You know, you've always been one of my favorite actors." <laughs> oh, wow. God. <laughs> I'm really sorry that you have participated in this fraud. Right. And, uh, you know, I've been railroaded and so forth. And then the greatest line of all, uh, he said, because the fact of the matter is, he says, you know, lots of people had access to that crawl space. Uh, <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> got to run. That's not to get rid of. Uh, That's brilliant. If house is in Vincennes, and if you get into the crawl space, there's a little bit of cramp down there because there's 33 bodies. But if you move them around a little bit, you can put somebody in there. But, uh, but this, this was what he wrote. Wow. And as I say, Kozenzak was one of the most interesting elements of it, uh, meeting him. Talk about a tough, scary guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, did not want Ko- you, know, you know what happened is that first night when that boy, this was the mistake that uh, Gacy made, uh, the first big mistake he made. He grabbed a real kid. He didn't grab a runaway. He didn't grab some kid off the street in downtown Chicago who was hustling. He grabbed the kid who had a job in this, this little pharmacy. And uh, Kozenzak had, I mean, uh, uh, Gacy had come into the store and was making a deal with the druggist. And he was, he was Gacy's type. He was a slight 15-year-old, blonde-haired, slim boy. And uh, the, the kid said to him, uh, said to the druggist, do you think he would... Give me a job. And the judge said, well, go, he's parked in his truck out there. Go out and ask him. This was on a Friday night. Went out and then disappeared. He didn't go home. And wow. because he had a home and a mother and a father and they had phones, they called the police. And the police, Kozenzak, who had just become a brand new detective, uh, responded to this missing missing person call, and the druggist said, "Well, I, you know, I, the thing I heard is he was talking to Gacy, this guy, this contractor. They got his address. They were there at midnight, knocking on the. And this right. is the element of the gate. Knocked on the door, the front door, and they had one of these old fashioned Victorian holes, keyholes, you know, where the, you see the." Panels slide back, and the eye appeared there, uh, like a like a uh, uh, like a, an old bar in the twenties. And uh, Gacy's eye appeared, and and Kozenzak just caught a glimpse of it because the other cop wasn't even looking up there. The thing went down. The light went out in the living room, and he didn't answer the door. And Kozenzak swore. He knew at that moment who this guy was. He knew it was bad. They went around the back of the house where they could see a TV on, like in a in one of these uh, glassed-in rooms, like a solarium, and somebody sitting in a chair knocked on the door repeatedly, and there was no response. And 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 Kozenzak said, "I knew that kid was in there, and he might even still be alive." But he couldn't go in. Legally, no. Right. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, Max, you have to be salivating here. We have the two stars from To Catch a Killer. Uh, why don't you join in and uh, ask the guys some questions? Well, I'm just riveted by all of this, but the first question I have is for Michael. And I want to know, as a young actor, as a guy who uh, is playing, basically, I mean, you're carrying the entire film. And you've got this tsunami of Dennehy coming at you. <laughs> screaming, yeah. ferocious, terrifying, screaming and calling you a Polak. How did that feel as an actor, like internally? I mean, can you disconnect and just inhabit the role of the detective? Or are you shitting your pants and going, holy God, Brian Dennehy screaming at me? Uh, <laughs> you know, the thing about Brian and, and all my friends that work at him, with him at Stratford, too, just attest to this. You know, yes, he is a, a force to be reckoned with, but he's just an actor's actor. And. You know, so there was a there was a kind of David and Goliath aspect to this to this uh, to the way Eric shot it and to the and to Brian and I together in this and these two characters. So that kind of lent itself to all of it. And I don't even know whether uh, 
this was conscious or unconscious, but Brian and I actually, I mean, we, we, we were at the same time, at the same agent. Was, we were with Susan Smith and at that time in L.A., and, and, uh, but we had never met before, and we shot the whole thing, and we didn't talk. I mean, uh, what, my, one of my fondest memories, actually, is we, you know, and like I say, whether it was conscious or unconscious, it was quite valuable for me, I realized a couple of days in, that when I talked to Brian, it was in character as Joe, and it was that same thing. We, there was no small talk by the craft service table, and it kind of lent itself to that and was very helpful for me, actually. And then on the last day, it was one of the last days we were sitting outside of the, of the house in a couple of, you know, those folding <laughs> set chairs, and that's the first time that, uh, you know, Brian and I actually had a conversation, but, but the whole film was now kind of behind us, and and that way of working, as I say, whether it was intentional or, or just it happened that way, it was kind of valuable for me. It was, uh, it, for me, it wasn't intentional. I just didn't like Riley, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this young punk? <laughs> well, <laughs> Polak. Yes, stupid Polak! No, what you guys are talking about, I mean, seriously, that comes off in the film. And, and Brian, oh. I would love to know, how the hell do you shake that darkness at day's end, or does it just suck you in throughout the entire shoot? Oh, it's just, you know, look, it's, it's like John, uh, jo, what was his name, what John Lovitz used to do? It's acting, acting. <laughs> <laughs> so you turn uh, it off it, and I listen, go have And I played some, I played, you know, I did Salesman 800 times. Yeah. Now, that's a dark place to go all yeah. over the world. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, you, you don't, I mean, at least as far as I know, you you, you don't take it with you. I mean... Not that there aren't times when it's uh, when it's difficult. The funny thing is when you walk into the theater sometimes and you say to yourself, I can't possibly do this again, uh, sometimes that's when the best performances come because you have no defenses left. You're exhausted. You have no defenses. You can't protect yourself. You can't protect the secret places of yourself, which is what you're always trying to do. And so something comes out that is absolutely uh, ripped. Yeah, yeah. But the fact is that uh, it's always been acting to me. I've never, I've never, I now I've known some people. I mean, uh, Phil Hoffman's a really good friend of mine. And uh, Phil was a guy, and I worked on eight months. We did uh, Long Day's Journey together. And uh, I saw him leave little pieces of himself all over the stage night after night. Mm -hmm. And I knew. You can't. You can't do that. You 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 can't do that. You are, there's only a certain amount of yourself that you can do. There are actors who do that. I've known a couple of them in my life, and none of them have survived very long. And when I say survived, I mean physically survived. And uh, now, maybe I'm just not a serious enough person, and I suspect that that's true. God knows enough people have told me that. <laughs> to me, it's. There's no reason why it can't be a good performance or even a great performance. But it is a performance. And, and it, sometimes if you see somebody, and I see a lot of them all the time, uh, who really, you know, <laughs> actually it's a great story. I, I did a play with Peter Brook, wonderful British director. We did uh, 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 Cherry Orchard. And he, he came back to see how the play was doing after a being away for a month or so, and he saw all these actors running up and down backstage and doing sit-ups and doing pull-ups and all. <laughs> and he said, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> was, and I, I could mention some names, but I won't. He uh, said, well, we're preparing. He said, but you're, you're going to walk out onto the stage into a room, start talking to people, and they're going to start talking to you what do you have to prepare for? <laughs> Once you've done the work, and we we did the work. Problem, unfortunately, in a movie, you get about twenty minutes to do the work. Mm -hmm. Then, when the guy says action, you do it, and, uh, uh, and and it's life. It becomes a piece of life. It may be a very grim, nasty piece of life, but whatever it is, it's a performance. You know, it's funny because you mentioned Hoffman, which that's not funny, but and my condolences, but you have endured a lot of loss with people you've worked with, and I want to get your feelings on Chris Farley. I both just lost one of the most important people, certainly in my life, 
and maybe in his, and that's Susan Smith, and I haven't recovered from that yet. Mm -hmm. How is it for you to be Irish? Well, uh, it's it interesting that you mentioned that. We had a house in Ireland for years. Uh, I think that probably the best adjective I can use to describe my being Irish or how, to, how it feels to be Irish is dangerous. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very dangerous. Uh, I've done a lot of theater in Ireland, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's very seductive. I mean, the whole, for me, you know, to go to the pub afterwards and hang out till God knows. I mean, in Ireland, years ago, they had the hours, right? 11.30 was uh, the last hour you could order. So what you would do is call, call down to the bar <coughs> that you were using, wherever the hell you were, and have them order 10 drinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the And yeah. the customers come in, and there would be the bar covered with 40 or 50 undrunk <laughs> which would then be consumed between then and 3 o'clock in the morning. So dangerous is a good word for me with Ira. Now, uh, as, it, as it is, I've, I've managed to, uh, to get through it all without completely destroying myself. But, uh, and now I'm of an age when I don't have that particular problem anymore. Or not in any, My wife wouldn't necessarily agree with that. But, uh, but, but, so you're uh, happy, Brian. No, I, I mean, I, you, you get on the stage and you're happy now. I mean, you've, you've suffered loss, you've been through a lot of crap, it's just acting, but are you happy? I was always happy. I mean, it depends about what you mean by happy. You know, I mean, if you asked Eugene O'Neill uh, when he was 50, was he happy? He would say, yes, he was happy. And, of course, he wasn't happy. <laughs> you guys, I mean, he was one of the most miserable human beings in the world. Now, Irishmen are probably the worst people in the world to ask that question. Of, uh, <laughs> exactly, that's the point. <laughs> but, uh, hey, when, John, when John Gacy died of a lethal injection, did it affect you in any way, shape, or form? Absolutely are you for no. death penalty? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that's a great story about that. Do you know that was the first lethal injection admi uh, administered in Illinois, and it, it didn't work. The first time through, it didn't work. He, he, something, somebody screwed up, and and he wasn't dead. His heart would stop, and uh, they didn't exactly know what to do. They closed the curtain and they tried to figure it out. I can only Co imagine that scene. Cozen Zach was sitting there with his nose pressed up against the window. Pornography. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Cozen Zach hollered in, "Wake him up and do it thirty-three more times." Wow! Oh. Wow! They, they, they did have a problem uh, killing him, but they eventually managed to do it. Uh, Adam, do you have anything for Michael and Brian? Yeah, you know, not so much a question as an observation. I watched uh, To Catch a Killer over the, the weekend, and, uh, you know, this was a movie that was made 22 years ago for network television. By today's standards, there would be so much more blood and, and gore and violence, and I think that the stakes would be raised that way cinematically. Uh, but, you know, what's amazing, what, what what the movie left me with is that, you know, you, you, the, the horror of this movie came from the performances, not from the special effects, not from the blood, not from the, the, uh, uh, the gimmick, so to speak. Uh, with, all, with all due respect, it came from Eric Till. Yeah. yeah. He, knew how, he knew how to shoot that movie. He knew exactly how to shoot it. He knew every scene. He knew how to make that camera drift. Yeah. So that you so that you were waiting to see what the frame was going to reveal, but you weren't sure whether or not you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, could, he, right. he, it was a genius piece of direction. I think that we all did a, our jobs really well. There, there were some really good performances in it. Some of the kids were great. The kid that I worked with in that cellar was great because that was a tricky scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, that but, was, uh, I thought, the most horrific scene uh, at yeah, the end of the that, film where the and cops again, are outside. only wow. suggested, you understand. Right. When you yeah. look at that scene, it's really only suggested. You oh, never absolutely. really see anything. You, it's all... It's all hanging there in the near future, just out of sight, which makes it worse. I mean, what's interesting about that movie is it should be shown to all young directors to show you what you can do with implication, what you can do with suggestion, what you can do with using the imagination of the audience rather than 
the palate of the special effects man. Right. Yeah. And the other thing for me I remember that was Eric was so helpful in is, you know, that you know, young actors playing cops, you know, there's a, there's this universal cliche sound to, you know, cops in a briefing room, you know, talking about the case and everything. And one of the things that he was really uh, great at is making uh, information dramatic because in all, all of the kind of, uh, you know, board room cops talking about what the latest, what, what do they have so far in front of that big board where it said Gacy's name and is that the dra- the information was the drama like the like getting a new little bit of information in, in a scene that you didn't have previously and kind of keeping track of all that and that actually became uh dramatic which was also a part of Eric's thing to, you know keeping keeping that alive without resorting to kind of cliche or pretense in any way was was also a great skill of his you know it's it's amazing to look at uh what Eric Till did i mean he seemed to do a lot of television and he would take on like four or five projects a year, which is amazing, Michael. Worked all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I worked with him a number of times. One of my favorite memories of Eric was uh, we were doing a, uh, a project where, uh, like a World War I thing where I was, I was the captain of this, you know, ship and everything. It was, it was a whole kind of thing on the East Coast. And so I shot a scene, um, and I can't remember his name now. Um, but an actor, we did a two-hander where it was the, the you know the, the officer, the commanding officer, and my character, and uh, David Hemblin, That's who it was, and uh, also like a very you know like Brian, it just has a lot of presence and a lot of uh, you know weight in his acting. And there was uh, we did the scene, and uh, you know I felt it was you know we we did both sides, and I, I kind of left the set feeling like it was pretty good, like. This, we, we were really connecting and everything. And then we, uh, we we wrapped, and I went to the hotel where we were all staying on the East Coast, and I see Eric Till sitting in the bar with a glass of scotch looking kind of down. And I, I walked into the bar. I said, Brian, are you okay? And he said, uh, 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 Eric, I, uh, Eric, are you all right? And he said, yeah, you know, you guys... I don't know how to cut that now," he said, "because you're both you were both so great. I I I just I'm dejected about. I don't want to lose anything by going on uh, either side. And to me, that was like that was Eric, you know, like he had an embarrassment of, of riches, and he was that was that was what dejected Eric is that it was just how am I going to do this, you know? There was just something that bespoke the man and the director and the artist in that for me. Amazing. Uh, guys, we're talking to Brian Dennehy and Michael Riley. Uh, we're talking about To Catch a Killer. Michael, how, I mean, listen, one of the most disturbing scenes in this film, I mean, by far to me, anyway, as a viewer, was at the end, like the last scene in the first part. Uh, he, Brian's dressed up as Pogo the Clown, and he is taunting you. And you could just see the, I mean, you get this. Like, I am going to get you, motherfucker, look in your face. Uh, how, I mean, watching Brian do that and behave like that, uh, how, I mean, was it, I mean, was it really disturbing? Well, you know, it was, at that point, it really is, you know, no acting required for a lot of reasons. You know, one, the weight of all of it, it was the episode ender. I mean, there's Eric's beautiful, as Brian referred to. His, his drifting camera moving slowly into both, you know, uh, Gacy's character with the, uh, you know, over with the kid dressed up as the clown, and then uh, on on Joe doing the same thing, and so it was really, you know, there wasn't much more to do but to just, you know, we had the whole weight of that thing around us. You know, everyone knew what that story was about, and and you know, having had having talked to Joe about even a scene like that, you know, you. You know, it was there, and uh, you know, there were times when Kozenzak, he was on, he'd come on set a couple times, and I, mem- I remember actually we had the set built for the crawl space, and that house, of course, when they finally took out all those bodies, was basically raised to the ground. But but uh, you know, we when 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 the set was built, it was built exactly from the blueprints of that house, and it was I I could see for Joe, and he said it was weird for him to be on that set. Uh, especially around the crawl space set, he it was and there, like you say, no bodies, no blood, nothing was shown. But that must have brought that back for him. It it did bring it back. And so there's something about, you know, I mean, any story has got its own. Even a fictional story, you you kind of give it its dignity by telling as much truth as you can about it. But when you're doing something that 
you know, families of victims are going to see and people are going to see and Joe is going to see. They're just, you know, that really kind of buoyed up uh, all all of those moments. And, yeah, and you know, and the, uh, one of the interesting things about that is uh, eventually he did leave, let the uh, two cops into the house. This right. Time. They were very suspicious at this point, but they had did not have enough to grab him. And knowing that he was going to do that, he turned off the exhaust fan that he had in the crawl space because obviously there was somewhat of an odor. And the other cop, not uh, not Michael, uh, asked if he could use the bathroom. And he went into the bathroom, and there was this very distinctive smell All right. coming up from the basement and uh that was one of the one of the uh, uh, the, uh and in fact Kozinsek said said that that happened that was one of the uh the, the way Eric moved that camera in that scene yeah up to that vent was uh well it's very, very powerful and very. It's so powerful that you you sm you actually smell it as yeah. a viewer. I mean, it's for you sure. Just, yeah, you feel disgusting. You get that scent, and that is really powerful stuff. And what's great from both you, Brian, and Michael, is that you're giving Eric Till like props, man. And what's going to be great is that he's one of the best directors I've ever worked with. Yeah, yeah, me yeah. too. And what's great is that you know he's not you know uh, Ron Howard or Rob Reiner or you know so on and so forth. Uh, he's someone that our listeners are now going to be able to go out and, and, and explore, you know, which is absolutely, which is yeah. great. And I got to hand it to the both of you for coming on here and really giving him uh, uh, an extreme amount of credit. That's fantastic. And also, also, I'd like to say one thing too about Kozenzak. Do you know that Kozenzak invented a method of uh, pressure? Uh, in tailing somebody that has now been adopted by, well, it was certainly adopted by the FBI, and they, yeah. and they essentially gave him credit for it, which was this, because Kozenzak had no money and he had no people, the only, he had to do this in a hurry. And what he did was he put what, what they call close surveillance. And these guys were, they, they their job was, including Michael, to let him know they were there. Right. right. To sit in the office, to move around, and uh, there's that wonderful scene with that wonderful Canadian actor playing the lawyer who comes out and yells at them. At the two house, what the hell are you doing here? Because that was not never done. That right. Time. Never and there was, a, there was a lot of stuff like that, too. Like, uh, you know, you kind of forget. But at that time, e even the word serial killer, I mean, that w it was almost coined during that whole thing. You know, this right. was, uh, not, you know, 32 bodies in a crawl space and the Jeffrey Dahmers and everything that was going to come later. No one had really, uh, you know, th this was 10 short staffed days before Christmas. You know, where a missing boy, Robert Peast, as, in, as uh, Brian was describing, they have a missing kid. It was just going to be thrown off into another file, and there was and there was just something that hit Joe when he, you know, all that stuff when he walked in that house that he was just not going to let that go. Right. And he became just dogged uh, about that. And, and he did. He ended up going on. And even the incorporation of the, the psychics into investigation. One of the things he told me was that, you know, he, he would go on the FBI lecture circuit after after the case broke and talk about the legal ways and ramifications and means of, of incorporating, uh, uh, you know, psychic testimony uh, into uh, into a case. So it, it was it was a first in so many ways, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, between. I, you know, you would think that between Gacy and Bundy, the media, the term serial killer, and the real idea that we have of what serial killers are comes from from those two cases, really. I think so. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, one, you know, for me, one last question, guys. I I, I know we're, you know, you've been, you've given us so much of your time already. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Brian and Michael, uh, why, what, how they feel about the whole, like, why people are infatuated with serial killers. 
Hitlers and how they're glorified uh, almost. Is this, uh, it, you know, is there any anything in your mind that that could come up with an answer to to why people are infatuated with this kind of stuff? Because even I'm guilty of it sometimes. You know, when I'm watching, I review a lot of movies and I talk to uh, uh, a lot of people, and there are, uh, you know, you know, leagues of people that are into this stuff, Brian. Yeah, I mean, you just had an incident here uh, in, in California where we had these two freaks, a husband and wife team, uh, who like to get dressed up as various... Uh, a lot of it now is, you know, has to do with the, the comic book movies and so forth. But right. uh, And they shot two cops to death, just walked up to them, shot them, and then shot themselves. One is Walmart. I think they killed somebody in there, and then they killed themselves. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, transgression and taboo uh, has long been a human preoccupation of one kind. I mean, all your, uh, ancient Rome, mm -hmm. Greece. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's it, even today in the in the in the uh, in the radical uh, Islamic world. I mean, the the the, the devices of uh, of death. Of torture for people who break the rules are so medieval, or even before that. I mean, it's this is existing right now. I mean, as some people would you know would call uh, illegal injection the same thing or whatever. I mean, the point is it's uh, it's always fascinating because uh, society, to some extent, and the rules and and laws have been. In very recent times, I mean, we're talking about 10,000 years. That's not a lot of time in oh. development of history. Have, have been imposed, uh, essentially, on, uh, you know, a bunch of thugs, a bunch of animals, which is what, which is what we recently all have been. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I know there's this idea that, well, we've all become, we've been civilized now for three or 400 years, 500 years, except... Civilized. And something happens that's obviously not civilized yeah. and uh, not civilized by, by allowed, sanctioned by the group. Uh, so, so much for civilization. <laughs> I don't think we're nearly as as uh, as much out of the woods as. Right, definitely. That's something well, I, George, I, I, George uh, Carlin used to say that a lot. Like we're we're hardly out of the jungles. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think and I think uh, because we've uh, you know. We've had to now sublimate as a species all of these darker, as Brian's saying, these transgressions and these taboos. They've, we've, we've pushed them down into this kind of shadow world for us. Uh, so I think I think as viewers, whether we're watching a play about this or a movie about this, I think we we note something that we've pushed down into our own cellar, you know, that we've got our own, you know, bits of our psyche buried in our own little crawl spaces. And I think when we watch something like this, it's because uh, we're like just a hair breadth away on the um, of a D, on the DNA chain from being in, in the same circumstance. You know, well, there's a fast, fascinating phenomenon going on now, which, in terms of my own lifetime, I think is, is interesting and disturbing. Which is, at least in my country, I'm not sure if this exists in other cultures, and I'm, I'm using the word culture in, in the broadest sense, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, the the whole fascination with uh, with zombies and with uh, right. uh, vampires. Right. I mean, it, it, you, you walk into Barnes and Noble, and there are whole s sections of books <laughs> written for kids. Right? Yeah. Written for sixteen year olds. Right. On on and all these movies that are made, you know, all dealing with. And uh, yet, I want to see you, Brian, in fangs and a cape, biting Michael's neck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if they can, if they, if they can find a triple X cape, uh, <laughs> Brian, you would never do a zombie movie. If George Romero, if George Romero called you up, come on, I wouldn't do it for George Romero because there's no money with him. <laughs> <laughs> but if somebody came up with the right price, which is, by the way, not that high these days, I was, I would do it in a minute. I'm, I can, I can, I can bear my fangs, my tobacco. <laughs> Scotch stained fangs as good as anybody. <laughs> the Walking Dead might be around the corner for you, Brian. Well, actually, if possible. I'd 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 like to use a wheelchair, but uh, but yeah, anything 
like that. Yeah, I can I can do that. I can flap my cape pretty good. <laughs> Not the only thing left I can flap, but uh. <laughs> Michael, you still have a strong libido, Brian. You're still you have a. How are you with the ladies? I think I, I think I think it passed through the house about a week and a half ago. I was <laughs> flagging it down. <laughs> <laughs> Michael and Brian, you've both been uh, fantastic, and for you both to come on and talk about this, uh, this re it's really a cult classic, really, to Catch a Killer from 1992. It's, it's been an honor, and it's been awesome. Um, Adam and Max, do you have any parting words for, uh, for our guests? Adam. Well, just thank, thank you both for, for taking the time and, and discussing this with us and giving us a little insight into the, to the process, which I'm always fascinated by, so I really... Uh, uh, appreciate that time. So yeah. now the deal is we're getting 5000 bucks a piece for this, right? Absolutely. <laughs> All of us, as far as I know. Brian, i got to be honest with you. My bank account is at negative 5000 right now. <laughs> oh, you're doing real good compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, guys, uh, Max and Adam and I are going to have a uh, little conversation about the film. Uh, well, hold on you. one second. I, I, I want to say something. Oh, okay. Sorry, Max. Now, listen, you two need to work together again because I think you're both fantastic. I think you have great chemistry. But I want to know, do you guys have any idea is this film going to see a rebirth? I want commentary. I want making of. I want a DVD. What's going on with this thing? Do you have any idea? You make it happen and Brian and I will be there. <laughs> That's right. We'll show up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, what's, it's, I think it's probably uh, it's, uh, one of the problems with a picture like this is we all appreciate how well this movie is made and how truly scary it is. And the reason why it's scary is because it's so real. It is so we all, all know that the circumstances are real, but also the, the, uh, the thing that's great about real terror is that it's banal. Mm -hmm. So that when that camera slips into that closet and then moves down, you're not, you're not seeing a uh, chains and, and, bars and blood and knives you're seeing a closet with things hanging in the closet uh till's genius was to understand that's what what's really scary is what's every day uh if, if photographed a certain way with a certain pace in the camera and, and and with your own knowledge uh that's what's terrifying well nowadays I mean, uh, the, the kind of things these kids go to see now are so in your face, ex shown yeah. to you, right. <clears throat> to you. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got somebody's pulsing heart ripped out of a chest. Uh, I, I think that the, the subtlety of a picture like, uh, you know, terrifying subtlety, mm -hmm. a picture like Gacy is a, is a whole different thing. And probably, probably the kids would just be bored stiff by it. Michael, did did Margot Kidder show up at the cast party? Uh, I don't even remember that. <laughs> Margot Kidder. <laughs> I remember Margot Kidder showing up at some parties. <laughs> <laughs> That's the interview I want to do. Yeah. To catch a killer. Part two. No, no, no. Great, great broad, great lady. I just don't. I don't remember that. I don't remember even remember that cast party, but. That's the Irish in me coming out. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a good one. Yeah, you and I both don't remember it. <laughs> so you, Brian, you've had a few. You've had a few shots with Margot, huh? Well, uh, no, I mean, I mean, just, shots of booze. I've never made a picture with <laughs> the one. She reminds me so much of Elizabeth Ashley, and I love Elizabeth. And she and I worked together, and a brilliant actress, Elizabeth. And so was Margot. Margot's a hell of an actress, um, but uh, but. God, I haven't seen her in 20 years, but uh, she did. Uh, she did come to the parties, as I remember. I got you. I got you. Are Meg Foster's I, eyes as magnificent in real life as they are on the screen? Oh, that's Michael. You got. I don't you, know if you, I've ever seen Meg Foster in person. Now, now somebody's going to tell me I made a movie with her, but uh, <laughs> which could be, you know. Uh, but there were those days, boys. You know that. Colombian marching powder was uh, marching all around my atmosphere, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that anymore. I hope not. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> no. I've, I've had my bouts with, the, with, with it, too. So I, I hear you. It's, it's, 
Well, I mean, I, it, was, it used to be funny in those days, I'm talking 20, 30 years ago, because you ran a picture, and the last thing that makeup would do was go around to check the actors for any white powder on their on the front of the <laughs> oh, well. Hi, little Or, or, or it's leaking out of their nose or something like that. <laughs> Uh, All right, fellas, hey, we've, we, we've got a real hold, David and Goliath here. Hold the camera for a minute. Hold the camera. Yeah, uh, let me just get that for you. There you go. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're rolling again. <laughs> Thanks. Brian, uh, did he – you asked him about Chris Farley before, right? Did Brian answer that? I did ask him, but, but – but Yeah, you know, that was, I didn't uh, want to push it. That was a tragedy. You know, it's a funny thing about both Chris and Phil uh, and a few others, George Scott uh, even more so. Uh, when you got the phone call – uh, you were shocked, but not surprised. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, n- nobody who knew them ever was. I mean, it was, uh, it was but it's very interestingly in the case of both George and Phil, not so much Chris, um, there was this compulsion to, to, uh, to attack themselves, uh, you know, in 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 ways that uh, that were uh, George had, had such hatred for what he did. Wow, he hated being an actor. Or now that's what he said. I mean, he liked the success, obviously. And rem- you remember the thing he refused to accept an Academy Award or some award. I can't remember which one it was. But but he uh, he always said, and we shared a few wild ass I remember one night one afternoon actually in a hotel and uh where he op- he insisted the bar be opened because it wasn't open yet uh, um, they opened it for him and I couldn't keep up with him although I did my best and uh he he, he essentially said he said this is a ridiculous I I don't like who I've become um unhappy with my work I'm unhappy with who I am and he was uh, he smoked one cigarette after another and drank one drink after another and a man who I had such enormous respect and affection for was uh, was bleeding out right there at a bar and uh, eventually it happened for real and that's coming from a man who's played the two greatest generals of all time General Patton and General Buck Turgidson yeah and he you know, he he wanted that, and he got that. And I mean, the interesting thing about this business is, uh, you know, the old story: be careful what you what you want because you may get it. And you know, and so many friends of mine, actor friends of mine, over the years, and I've been around a long time. They say, if in essence, what they say every day is, if I can just get this, I'll be happy. If I can just get this, it will all make sense. And they get it. And, of course, it doesn't because it hasn't got anything to do with that. You know, happiness is a choice. You know, self-satisfaction uh, or self, self-content uh, is a choice. It's not a, it's not a goal achieved or reached. It's a choice that you make about yourself. And, uh, and you've got to make it over and over again. Can't, you just don't make it once. Right. There are lots of days when you say to yourself, "Man, uh, what the hell? Where am I? What? Who am I? What the hell am I doing?" So oh, you got to make. It. Amen, brother. Yeah, dude, totally. Actors, in particular, are artists, but we get great rewards, which we do from time to time, not always. Um, think that those rewards are going to be, you know, the answers and. It's not, not necessarily the way it works. Right, no. well, Brian, do people still mistake you for Charles Durning to, to this day? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's dead now for three years. And I, a lot of I get a lot of Brian Keith. He's been dead for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, thank you so much. The both of you, thank you, Michael, really, for taking the time out. Brian, thank you so much. You were both fantastic. I could sit here... And uh, boy, I'd love to just sit in a bar and, and hang out and talk to the both of you. You're, you're both amazing and extraordinary talents. And thank you so much for putting To Catch a Killer together, being a part of a, a, a cult classic film uh, that's just still alive to this day. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Thank you, guys. You know, you know what the problem 
problem is with cult classics? What? You're supposed to say what? Yeah. <laughs> you don't get paid for them anymore. Mm. Uh, you only get paid once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brian's all about making the money, Michael. <laughs> I am at this age. <laughs> When I started, I didn't. You didn't have to pay me at all. I'd do it for nothing. <laughs> all right. Uh, Max, Adam, and I are going to have a, a discussion about *To Catch a Killer*. Max wrote a, a wonderful intro to the film. He's going to read that next. Uh, thanks again, Michael and Brian. Okay, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Much. Thank you. Michael, right. thanks, okay, we'll look up one of these days. All right, buddy. You that got it. Great. Right. Great, to, great to talk to you again, Brian. Bye bye. Bye. All right, Max. Go ahead and take it, dude.